Hello and welcome to Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. I am joined here today by Audrey. Hi everyone. Uh, David. Hey hey. And I am your host Alexis uh, from Belgium. Hello. Uh, unfortunately, Fen is not available today to uh, to join us, but I will be your host. Um, but before we get on to the different topics today, uh, we can do for with the uh, board game catch up. So what have you been up to, Audrey? Nothing. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, yeah, I st still haven't done much because uh, the last uh, weeks I've been handling the end of the um, Lantern's Rain Discord uh, pinup painting competition from the Kingdom Death Range. Uh, that has been a huge amount of work, to be honest, uh, handling all the entries. Like, why do people send the entries on the two last days? Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I've, I, I've, I've been getting uh, some entries uh, as soon as one week, uh, maybe two weeks uh, had gone through. But uh, I probably got uh, a quarter of the entries on the last two days, maybe the last three days. And yeah, it, it was huge work. Uh, and then it was uh, managing all the um, all the judging, uh, communication, communicating on the various um, social media to get people to know when there would be the live judging, coordinating the live judging, making sure that uh, I would uh, know the results so that then uh, rewards could be distributed, etc., etc. Now I'm now I'm handling the the rewards part, so uh, asking people what they want to pick out of the pool, telling that to the people that is shipping, and yeah, people that gifted uh, prizes for the brace pool have been amazing. Um, people participating to the competition have been amazing. We got more than 120, almost 130 entries uh, in total Oof. from more than 100 people. Uh, it, it's been an amazing experience, and that led to three amazing judging videos that are on Trent Denison's uh, channel, all hosted there on YouTube, uh, so that anyone interested in uh, mini painting and in judging for big competitions like uh, World Model Expo, Scale Model Challenge, Adepticon, uh, maybe Golden Demon as well. Uh, anyone curious about that can go check these videos. There are 12 hours of video. It's been, uh, an amazing adventure and I judged for five out of the 12 hours. Uh, I was exhausted. <laughs> at the end. I can imagine. I, I'm almost... I'm almost a bit surprised that there was so many people like ready to do that for KDM, uh, you know, six years waiting for more content. I would not have expected to be that many entries at the moment. Uh, well, the, la the last time we'd done such a competition, it was in uh, 2019, uh, and we had 50-ish people that, that participated. And at that time, we hadn't advertised that much everywhere. Uh, we hadn't asked for a prize pool. It was centered on Echoes of Death and not on a uh, Kickstarter product, while this one was uh, centered on pinups, uh, which are a good part of for Kickstarter products that we've received so far, but we also opened it to seasonal mini so that people could enter their Pashas, their uh, Devil Satan, uh, so many different um, miniatures. So yeah, we really had um, amazing things. We had um, large size entries, small size entries. We had everything. And at some point, I think that uh, having that live judging being done uh, was a real uh, catch for several people and I know more than one person joined especially due to the live judging. So yeah, yeah, really been an amazing experience. Uh, I'm really happy that it happened, but I'm also really happy that now it's finished. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> I can yeah. imagine. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's it for me. Um, David, what have you been up to? It's been a while since you've <laughs> last been on the podcast. Yeah, a lot actually. Like I finished my mastercraft and like or bachelor <laughs> professional which is like kind of a big deal because it was like a lot of work, like learning all that stuff within four months, then doing all those uh, eight exams. And then three months later, because of delays and everything, uh, then the final verbal exam, which I've also passed pretty well. So overall, I'm happy and I got a new job, which is like the big reason why I'm not that active anymore at the moment. 
Yeah, congrats on that. Yeah, thank you. So I'm working as an instructor uh, now for like yeah, apprentices and trainees inside like uh, for inside the metal workshop. So that's pretty pretty cool job. So I'm really happy about that. Yeah, and otherwise uh, I didn't have much time to play any games at all. Like the only game I actually played uh, like two sessions so far is uh, All Storm. <laughs> ah. And yeah. Everybody has been recently. Yeah. No, not me. <laughs> not you, and no. not me. <laughs> so not well, everybody. So it's <laughs> one thing. It's like it's, it's actually quite fun. My wife and I had had a good laugh about like the storyline so far. It's like yeah, it's 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 grim dark, very grim dark, <laughs> but in a in a good yeah. good way way over the top. You know, it's like it's good. That's what I've been hearing from the uh, other on the podcast. I think that last episode or two episodes ago was all about uh, Oathworm. So if anybody is interested, you know, you know where to find us. Yeah. So uh, Alexis, what have you been up to? Well, uh, recently lots of walks. Um, I have been playing, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But I've been playing the. Um, uh, Prelude campaign of Tainted Grail uh, Age of Legends uh, that I will talk about a little bit. Um, it was very, uh, it's very fun so far. I've not uh, finished it yet. Um, I've not been playing that much other stuff at the moment. I still, uh, I'm pushing back my uh, Mage Knight uh, playthrough. I give it, a, I give it a little try, but I think that I want to uh, dedicate it a whole weekend or something like that to to really get into the uh, grunge of things. Um, the one thing that I've done recently is uh, writing a little um, in-universe uh, zine for Mothership because they were re running a zine jam uh, on their Discord uh, and I've submitted my, uh, my little version of a um, conspiracy theory uh, in space uh, zine. Uh, so that should hit uh, H.io soon-ish. Uh, I'll probably show some stuff if it's approved in the uh in the uh the mothership jam uh so yeah i'm looking forward to that um other than that uh not too much but uh today we're going to discuss about a couple of games um why don't you uh, start us up audrey uh yeah i have decided today to talk to you about Erin. Uh, Erin is a French crafted dungeon crawler game done by Arcada Studio, which uh, currently have a new campaign done for a more sci fi game. Uh, my husband picked Erin on the shelves of um, our game store uh, due to yeah, it, it, be, it was in the um, shelves on the side of the heavier games, uh, dungeon crawlers like Descent. Uh, more campaign games like Tented Grey, etc. It was in the middle of that, so he was intrigued and uh, we picked it. So, as I said, it's a dungeon crawler game, and like the newest uh, Descent, it's based with of an, on an app. So, we installed the app and um, we played. So, you, it's like any dungeon crawler, you have a character, you, contr you control this character, you move it on the map, you have monsters, you fight the monsters, you loot the treasure, you interact with items, uh, you, you fight the big boss, you gain XP, your character gets stronger, and you go on to the next adventure. But this one has a few twists. Like, uh, first of all, it's been crafted to be playable at, at, I'm not going to say any number of players, but with um, kind of um, adversary player. So you can play all players, all being potentially one, against uh, the uh, Master of Shadows. Uh, in French, it's Maître des Ombres, which would translate as Master of Shadows. Uh, I'm not sure how they translated it uh, in the in English, uh, but uh, you get the idea. So that's the person that controls the monster, that makes them do stuff, um, act, and that can use traps, for instance, against the player. We haven't tried this mode, so I can't really talk about that one. Uh, we only played the co-op game, uh, which is what you'd expect, like the monsters are a bit controlled by the AI, and the players move their characters, do the regular stuff that they do and then there's a final mode which is the arena which is um, a kind of fight as many waves of monsters as you can 
and you can play this uh, mode uh, if with a shadow master or not it's up to you so I think that that's a very good thing uh, to have these different monsters and uh, in the uh, rulebook, they all have a color, like the, ma the shadow of the master of shadow part is violet, the solo cop things are um, turquoise, and the arena mode things are yellow, which is very good because it helps you uh, go through the rulebook and see what's important uh, for your game. So I think that's really handy because uh, the rulebook in my opinion isn't really well organized because you will have some double pages about the master of shadows then uh, adventurers then spells uh, the spells part was really confusing for me then after the spell part you have how to create your character uh, then you got the explanation of the character sheet then how to level up um, then you get to the talents which are generally actions um, it, it, then the actions that part is okay uh, what your player can do uh, different actions fighting actions looting actions etc etc but yeah uh, except that it's a bit confusing in my opinion and with uh, the games that we did there are a few things that I didn't uh, understand properly um, in terms of complexity what would you put it if you compare it to like Midira and Kingdom Death for very low okay that's very good then like it, it, very low complexity. Right? Yeah, it's it's low complexity, but it's uh, I will say confusing not... in the way that you explain. Is that yeah, possible? same way you have talents. Uh, you have a kind of talent tree, uh, but it's not organized really as a as a tree. It gets um, in a weird shape, so you can't really uh, draw a design of the talent tree. You see. Uh, to know what you need to get the next talent and that, that part is confusing as well just like the, the rule book part for instance um, that's good yeah uh, the, I, the resources like this... are clear yeah you, you I, I have like tokens a lot of <laughs> Sorry, I, I'll let you continue. Sorry. Yeah, you have tokens for each resource so that, uh, for instance, for the HP, you get uh, four or five uh, HP tokens depending on what your character has. Uh, you use them uh, as you get, as you take damage, you uh, take them off. That's very clear. Um, yeah, in the ID of uh, the game, it's not badly done, but a bit confusing. For me, the major gripe was the application because we got it when it was just out and the application apparently has been uh, improved a lot since then but uh, I'm not going to say that uh, we haven't tried again but we haven't tried it again because the application has a few problems the first one is both a problem and a, a really good thing is that the application is fully online you have to be logged on, you have to create an account and you have to have internet to play that's a good thing because the developers can improve uh, the application easily and they can also improve the database because the application gives you a huge database of items to loot for instance so any day they can decide to add more items to loot in the database so for instance uh, if you play at Christmas you might be able to uh, loot um, any candy or chocolate or <laughs> anything that feels Christmassy at uh, around Halloween, you could loot uh, anything that feels pumpkin-y or scully or whatever. So that's a very good thing. But um, then some people don't like to play online. Some people don't have access to a stable connection. Um, so that part can be annoying to some people. And um, yeah, the, the, having to create an Arcada Studio account. Uh, now I'm getting all the spam for their current Kickstarter and I... Nah, nah, that, that annoyed me. Um, we talked about applications when I presented Destinies or was it Fen that did it? I don't remember, but anyway, that I doesn't think, matter. I think it was Fen. Yeah. In uh, yeah. Erun, you don't have your characters on the map. You really handle all the positioning of the characters and the monsters on the app. That's a big difference uh, that really uh, gives more importance to uh, the tiles. You place the tiles when you open the doors, etc., etc., which is a cool thing because you really 
feel that you can't just play with the app, which was something that I almost had the feeling uh, with Destinies, but here you just can't play with just the app. So that gives a bit more um, leverage to all the physical components. One big problem of the application uh, was that it's supposed to have voice recognition. So you can say, for instance, the mage checks for traps, which uh, will um, uh, lower the risks of having a trap happening as the uh, turn event on the next turn, which is good, except that the application had lots of troubles with the voice recognition and uh, that can really stole a game, uh, we ended up several times having to write it instead of telling it uh, because the voice recognition was uh, strangling so much and that's lost time completely. So that part was uh, a bit a bit annoying. All the part with um, interacting with the items, opening doors, uh, looting chest was just awesome. And that part is totally linked to the evolving database, etc., etc. And th that part was really great. And I really want to commend uh, the Arcada Studio guys on that because if you just loot an item, you get the name of the item, but you also get all the full um, stat box of the item. So you don't have to open your uh, booklets. You don't have to check what the rules of the item are. If at any point you uh, don't remember what an item does, you can ask the application as well, and it will provide you an answer um, if it understands you. Uh, but you can always have reminders for items, so you don't need to always have your rule book. Uh, you can also ask the application questions about the rules if you feel like it. So there are really some, in my opinion, good points about it, but uh, some drawbacks uh, in the way that it's been crafted, which made it um, heavy, heavy feeling. I felt like more, the most complexity of the game was coming from the app and not from the game. That's that's good. Um, I think that an app like this is very helpful with uh, with games like uh, like that. Um, there definitely is a lot of space in the board game uh, in the board game uh, space for a game that is not that complex but still has the the dungeon crawling mechanics that uh, that we've been uh, enjoying. But I think that. Games like um, Gloomhaven and and Oathstorm have a, sometimes a little bit too many moving parts for for some people. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I think that it's nice to have uh, easier games to to get into. Like for Gloomhaven, it would have been perfect. Like with a, like you don't like not like an actual app for playing the game in general, but like for the AI, just like some some support app that tells you how the AI moves in that certain case. You know. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes yeah. there's a there's a lot of board games that feel like they kind of plan the thing to be a computer game and then abstract those like computer mechanics into cards, and it doesn't always work. And using an app is a good uh, answer to that. Yeah. Yeah, so you can have an event uh, that says that on this turn uh, the um, uh, the monsters have this special ability. It's one possibility, for instance. Or this time they decide to attack the closest enemy, or the farthest, or the one with the lowest HP. I gotta say, I really like the art of the game also. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit off topic, but I've been looking a bit about the, the, how the game looks, and I think that it, it looks quite nice. Yeah, the, the art is pretty cool. It's a bit stylish uh, without being too cartoony, uh, which lets them have um, uh, sharper features uh, for the characters without them looking uh, just with weird proportions. So yeah, overall I think it's uh, yeah one other grip that I have is with the tiles. We have lots of tiles for the um, floors, corridors, room, and I don't know that uh, because I haven't opened all the scenario book because I want uh, to keep it a secret, um, and I'm not sure that there will be at any point one scenario that uses every single of the tiles that we have, and thus why we really need uh, that many. Same goes for all the stamina uh, 
HP and stuff like that tokens, but uh, that's probably because we played uh, low level characters and when you get to a higher level, you get so many more. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, that's it for me with Erin. Yeah, that sounds like a great game. Yeah, it sounds it sounds really fun. Um, it, it came out, like, very recently, right? Uh, I think it was spring. Yeah. Um, it's on the, like, 200 euros range, from what I see. Um, uh, the, the core bo- um, in, in retail, you get mostly only the core box, which is 80 euros. Oh, that's good. That's nice. Yeah. That's, I'm guessing then that's like the, the ultimate uh, Kickstarter edition. Yeah, the world. Heroic Edition, as it's called, uh, has um, more than twice the playable character things. And I think you probably have more enemies because in the uh, core box, the miniatures of enemies that you get are really not that many. You have uh, mostly rats, uh, skeletons, zombies. Uh, goblins and some white sorlish stuff, which is more than enough uh, for most players anyway. Yeah, I can imagine that. Um, speaking of uh, dungeon crawling, if you if you're done with your topic, yeah, yeah. On the on the topic of uh, dungeon crawling, uh, recently David has been. Um, into uh into some odd uh, <laughs> calling <laughs> yeah so uh, that, that is not the smoothest transition but we'll we'll go with it yeah we'll just go with the flow <laughs> so uh, i'm going to talk about the into the odd rpg it's a remastered version i think the original came out in 2014 uh, it's written and uh, everything was done by Chris McDowell. The new version, however, is uh, like supported by Johan North, uh, the graphic designer who also brought uh, yeah, Merkborg and uh, a lot of similar old school revival RPGs to life by his very unique graphical style. And so let's talk about Into the Art. Into the Art is a RPG, as I said before. It's an old school revival one. So the rules itself, they are very, very easy. Like you have like, I think you have three uh, attributes, like three ability scores and you roll, just roll the die, throw the die and then just generate your character. Like I think you roll like, uh, yeah, you roll three, three D six for your three ability scores. So 3d6 for strength, 3d6 for dexterity, and 3d6 for willpower, and then 1d6 for hit protection, which is like your HP. And that's about it. That's your whole character. And basically, then you just look up. You have some kind of table where you have like your HP on the top and your highest uh, attribute on the side. And then you just look it up. And there's, let's say, you have rolled a 14 for your highest uh, ability score. And it's just says pretty much uh, you have like a like a cane, walking stick, acid, spyglass, and uh, a magical artifact. And that's it. That's the whole cra- uh, character creation. And I think it fits the setting quite well because the setting itself is yeah rather unique. It's like a world. Let's let's imagine like Jules Verne. A bit more like steampunkish, a little bit more like maybe uh, Dishonored would be too much, but something in that direction. And uh, you have like one big city called the Bastion, where like everybody goes if you want to work. And the world is just massive. Like the world is not, it's not possible to explore the world because it's so big. And then you have this strange things happening because. There are like some cults and uh, star things, basically like cosmic horror uh, thrown into the mix. And uh, the explorers try to discover some things called arcanas, which are like magical artifacts that can can do like they could heat some water, just uh, as an example. Or you could have some kind of uh, glyph that you could attach to a wall and then you have a portal stuff like that and they can just like break the whole rules of the system itself but also like the physical limitations of the world they can go completely crazy um and basically yeah the bastion that's like the main city 
and you have like uh, it's big bit of like a Charles Dickens like city with like uh, a lot of industry. Uh, there's a lot of smoke in, in the in the sky. You have like a massive sewer system called the underground, and then you have cultists and star beings everywhere. There are like uh, yeah strange things happening in every single corner. Like you will have like some cultists, uh, like uh, yeah maybe talking to to uh, to an idol somewhere, and on the other side you have like maybe just people. Uh, trying to collect a group for the next exploration to find a certain arcana outside of the city. It's it's a strange setting, but I like it a lot. And why I like it, it's because like the artwork complements the whole theme just perfectly. Like you, they they look like those old fantasy drawings from like the like twenty or thirties. They look but spiced up with like. Uh, newer newer graphical elements and I have to say while Merkborg from a artistic point is like mace to the face it's like really really strong this is way more ele- elegant yeah it's like it's like uh, yeah the art is like very impressive but into the art is uh, way more elegant about that like it's it's uh, also way more readable <laughs> Because like it's yeah. it's like you have clear pictures, you have like uh, the whole uh, book is uh, way more clear overall. I have to say, and uh, yeah, it's just in general just a very very cool uh, yeah RPG in overall. It's not super complex. Don't get me wrong. It's not a game that you can play like for let's say. A whole massive campaign. It's a game that you can just pick up in one evening, tell your players like yeah, some basic rules and just roll with it. And the nice thing is, the nice thing, person thing, uh, the nice thing I think is that you can actually go completely crazy as a RP, like your dungeon master, because the system is very very open. You know, you can throw like those those. Um, industrial themes you can just throw in some like cosmic horror you could just com- go completely crazy like one of the uh, the entry level uh, introductory adventure is called the iron coral it's basically there you have this, the ocean and suddenly it's some yeah iron coral is just growing outside of the city and the people can go there and explore it and then weird things happen inside this uh, coral. There's there's no explanation for it. It just happens. And that's like the whole thing about the system. Um, I I didn't play it into the art, but I, I had an eye on it because uh, the, the person that created it, uh, I think it's Chris Mac... Chris McDowell. Yeah, Chris McDowell. Uh, he made uh, Electric Bastion Land beforehand, which was also like a very OSR, like slightly more design than Into the Art. Into the Art seems to be more uh, streamlined and, and more uh, very about getting character into into play and just having fun. Uh, but he's, he's definitely a really cool uh, designer and, and write, writer in general. Um, I, I really like the, the artwork that John Nor uh, went for uh, in the in the page that you, uh, that I've seen of the of the book. Um, as you said, like it's it's a lot more legible than than um, a monk book, but it still has this very um, specific style, like very uh, evocative in a way. Uh, I, I it's a game that I definitely had uh, had my eyes on before, and I'm glad that you brought it up because. Uh, uh, I, I cannot have forgotten about it. Yeah, it's definitely like one of the standout games for me from of the last years because of the overall artwork and like overall setting. It's like, uh, as I said, you can just introduce players into this yeah strange world in, in a single evening and it would be completely okay. And then you could play it with a different group and go, yeah, just do something completely else with, this, with the setting. You know? Yeah, that, that's the freedom that most um, RPGs with simple systems allow because you don't feel constrained by it and so you can feel more free to just 
do anything to adapt more to your players. You are not like, for instance, with D&D, oh, you meet a zombie, oh, let me check the stat of the zombie. No, you can just move things around as you wish. Yeah, exactly. And and you have also those big tables, which is, which are pretty easy. Like, what kind of... You have, like, these tables. You can just roll. Like, you found an arcana, like this... What I, or arcana, what, this is just like this uh, magical artifact. And you can just roll... Uh, on on some tables and find out like some kind of weird description and then it doesn't say what it does exactly but it gives you an idea what it could do in theory <laughs> so then you can be just be very creative with it you know yeah that that seems like a very fun game to throw in a, an evening or a long weekend with some friends uh without having to to think about doing a long campaign but just having a, a more um experimental uh role playing session that sounds like a lot of fun just just, just as an idea of how the tables look like you have like uh borough council decisions like borough is like a quarter of your of the bastion and then you just roll the dice and look what's happened and let, let's say uh, one of the council decisions is launching a cosmic ro rocket <laughs> and <laughs> then you have the next table what is the general public reaction <laughs> And one, like it's a D6, one is riots. <laughs> or six, six is, uh, well, it's about time. You know, there, there's a lot of like, also like this kind of, uh, yeah, f funny situation that it can just uh, come up, you know? <laughs> yeah, you can have some silly randomness. Yes. And that's, uh, I think, but at the same time, it's like those, those images are like super ev evocative. Because, like, just imagine you have this uh, a Charles Dickens-like city, and your your city, your borough uh, council just decides we want to launch a rocket, and they actually do it, and people start to riot because of it. <laughs> and then you have these strange arcana and cultists running around doing random stuff. So yeah, that's that's a massive uh, yeah combination. It looks for sounds fun at least. I didn't have the chance to play it yet, I have to be honest about that. But overall, it seems to be like, uh, yeah, very easy to make a cool story with it. And that's, I think that's the, the main strength of, uh, strength of, um, old school revival RPGs. It's more about the theme and, uh, the overall story than like rules. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like the, I think it's the Ember RPG, which is made of the nine princes of Ember stuff uh, in the same world where you have, yeah, three stats basically, and it's as simple as if you have more uh, in the score of the, uh, of the stat than the opponent, you win, and if you are close enough, well, the DM is going to ask you to roleplay it and see if it works, and that's it. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I really like the, the kind of a revival of a RSR game that has been happening for the past, like, four or five years-ish. Um, one thing that I really like about um, Into the Art is that it very much looks like m like a heart by way of Mothbok, um, the, the spire game that is uh, not very OSR, like it has a very specific system, but this kind of feels like a very, like mixing that um, sort of eldritch, uh, strange dungeon delving with um, a more or it's our system, like a more simple, uh, fun and directly um, rewarding system. Um, yeah, that looks extremely fun. Uh, did you want to, to add anything to it? Uh, to be honest, like, I, I can <laughs> just like the example, uh, like the sample hazards, like this book has a lot of samples, like what could, thi what could things look like? And, um, yeah, you could just, uh, there's like, like a balancing ledge must be crossed to reach with whatever lies on the other side. That's like, you know, your the typical trap, but you could combine it with like some kind of, uh, yeah, Asher-like issues where the whole room turns. And then it's just as simple just saying, okay, if you don't make it, you have to make a dexterity save and that's it. <laughs> you know? It's a very simple system. Yeah. And that, that provides for some uh, pretty fun role playing session, I'm sure. Um, I if you if you get to to play around with it, I'd be uh, be very happy to. to oh, sure, I will let, let you know. I might try to to give it a try myself. 
Um, yeah, it sounds fun. So um, beyond uh, this game, uh, what I've been playing recently uh, is uh, Tainted Grail, Age of Legends. Uh, it's the prelude to the Tainted Grail uh, game. And I'm going to be honest, I like Tainted Grail, but I thought that the main campaign was a very much bogged down by uh, some of its mechanic, like mostly the, the survival aspect of it. I thought that it was sometimes a drag, uh, reviving many sometimes forces you to like um, basically rotate the same action again and again to try to get the resource that you need and the game could be grindy at some point. I've not yet finished the Age of Legend campaign but so far, I'm enjoying it a lot more than the original one. Please um, don't spoil! I, yeah. I'm doing the other campaign first. You're doing the, the last, other campaign the, the last night? night first because that's the order that was advised for the storylines uh, stuff. Ah, yes. And how are you finding the, the, the last night one? So uh, there is a bit of a drag that uh, we could find because uh, without spoiling too much, as there is a big mechanic card uh, linked to it. There is a cold mechanic because the land has gotten cold, blah, blah, blah. And so you have a cold, uh, a freezing token that you can get under certain circumstances. Uh, and it limits your health. Um, and the, then if, you, if it limits your health, you get all the uh, consequences of uh, health being maybe lower that you would expect and uh, since it's frozen there is less food everywhere there are less stuff so it does get uh, grindy but um, going through the places uh, enjoying seeing the same uh, uh, cities um, towns uh, everything but at a different moment uh, is amazing getting to see um, all the um, myths of the main campaign, uh, but under a different circumstance, is um, amazing in my opinion. And for you, it's probably the same. You have another uh, point of view on all of this. Yeah, that's that's what uh, that's what's been happening in the the campaign so far. The intro of it is very interesting because it kind of it starts on a battlefield. I'm not going to spoil things too much but it it kind of for the first chapter puts the player in a very survivally um uh mood and that works really well because the mechanics uh, lend themselves well to it and the grind is not outrageous because it works well with the rest of the adventure but it doesn't last long because as soon as you start getting your feet on the ground in the campaign uh, things start to be it's not a, a like a power fantasy where things go really well for the player, but it feels a lot more fair than the f the, the initial campaign. Uh, not so much fair, but more you don't need to grind. You don't need to be uh, constantly looking out for to, to try to to make sure that you'll be okay. the The campaign feels easier, or at least your character feel better and more prepared to face the world and the world at least to me feels more interesting because you are basically exploring uh the land of the the, the i think it's uh, happening on avalon i'm not sure exactly which uh, i don't remember exactly the the name of the the, the arturian name that they picked for the setting because it's not really arturian it's just kind of their imagination of it but anyway you 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 are exploring it for the first time so the game uh, throws you a lot more information as you discover things and it feels a lot more fresh than um, than the, grill, the initial campaigns that feels where you arrive in a world that is kind of decaying and already in a rut. Um, I think that's more interesting. I... I like Tainted Grail, but I'm not sure I would uh, recommend it on a, like by itself fully because it's a bit expensive and the main campaign can be a bit grindy. It's, it's kind of a, an acquired taste. But I would say that the Age of Legend, if you have Tainted Grail, is definitely a recommendation. And from what I'm hearing from Audrey, it seems that the, the uh, last night is also a lot better than the, the base one. I think that they learned from making the game as they are. Uh, 
they made the second one. Yeah, I also can't wait to start the Red Death, uh, which I also got, to see what you do with experienced characters going on a whole uh, other adventure somewhere, since you can start the Red Death from any characters that did uh, any campaign, which is completely yeah. awesome, because if you love this character from this from campaign A and another character from campaign B, I think you can probably bring these two characters uh, on the Red Death. And by the time this podcast airs, the next uh, campaign for the Kings of Ruin might be up, since it's starting the 20-something late of September. Yeah, I think it's 28. I'm not sure exactly. Nine, seven. I don't, I don't know anyway. It, it doesn't really matter, but I do plan to pledge uh, to end up getting uh, everything that is gameplay. I'm, I don't plan to get uh, boxes of miniatures. And I know plan. that I will take the, I think it's $8 uh, that has been announced, um, set for the a modification of the core game to have a story mode that's less grindy and stuff like that. Uh, it, it modifies a bit all of the existing content already. Um, it yeah. uh, brings a bit less cold issues to uh, the last night campaign. Um, etc etc so uh, uh, that's something that i am very excited in and uh that might be something for which if there is an early shipping option uh, i might take because that's my french version and if i take again the french version i'm going to wait for three years and I, it's not something that i would or, love or like alexio for 10 years and uh, see your grandkids uh, growing up without tainted grill <laughs> <laughs> um poor alexio ju- Jokes aside, I, I also looked a bit into the campaign. I, I'm not sure I'll back it, mostly because I still have three campaigns of Tainted Grail to do before I um, before trying the new one. I'm uh, confident so maybe... I have at least one finished by the time it delivers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, is, that is true, it's not going to deliver immediately. But I, I that's the only reason why I'm waiting, because I think that they probably will have done uh, a better job at making a campaign with the experience of making the first uh, tree uh, out of the gate. Yeah. And I think that, um, I think that the Awaken Realms has really grown into company with the, la- the last few um, uh, games that they released. Like they, were, they are not, none of their game are perfect, but they always improve what they're doing. And I think that they're always fair and, um, location uh, like different localization shipment uh, aside usually they do a really good job at leading their campaigns and i think that's that's something that's uh to their credit yeah um, i really like the idea that you get some uh gameplay uh stuff as stretch goals uh i i think that's really great instead of cosmetic stuff uh etc etc because it really gives you the feeling that you, you really get extra stuff uh, that's useful that will that you will spend time on and not just some trinkets to put uh, on a shelf. Uh, I love that. Yeah. Um, also, I, um, I, enj- I, I do plan to pledge as well for another reason, which now I can't remember, which is pretty annoying. Yes, um, I remember seeing that they will add in the storybooks some uh, red covered uh, bits like there is in Midara with a red revealer that you will use to see the text that's written under it in green. And I think that they did a really good job in the first campaign, uh, the first campaigns, and that they are doing uh, even more there to really uh, avoid that even let's say fast readers like me uh, risk of seeing the text just by mistake from the corner of the eye and I love this <laughs> yeah um, I, I, I'm i really looking forward to whatever Awaken Realms is going to do in the future because they've, they've been very fair with the way that they, they do campaigns um, so yeah, uh, I would definitely recommend Age of Legends. Uh, Audrey would definitely recommend uh, The Last Night. So I think that's uh, that's a pretty solid recommendation, uh, at least on our part. Yeah, I recommend it more than I recommend Erun, but for different reasons. <laughs> um, and I think that's all the time that we have for this episode. Uh, you can catch us at patreon.com slash thelastandy or at thelastandy on Twitter. Uh, and until next time, we have been The Last ND.
So it's a goodbye from David. Bye. Audrey. Bye bye. Myself. And remember that the second E in standee is for epics. <laughs>